Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we stand in the house of the Lord tonight? We usually start Wednesday night service with a time of prayer. Something that's been on my mind lately is I don't want to pray selfish prayers anymore. I spend so much time talking to God, asking and begging for things for me that sometimes I forget that there are all these people around me that are in my life and, and people that I care about, people that I love about that need things from Him also. And tonight, I just want us to come together. I know that we all have needs. I know that we have desires and we have dreams and we have things that God wants. We have so many things that we need God to do in our lives. But tonight, I just want to ask us if we would set ourselves aside and that we would pray for the person beside us. He knows the needs that we have. He knows the desires of our heart. But I, I just want to ask you tonight, if you're comfortable with it, lay hands on your neighbor and pray for their needs. Pray for their desires. Pray for the people in Florida tonight. Pray for those that were affected by the last hurricane. Pray for those out on the East Coast. And let's just spend some time tonight thinking about our brother and thinking about our sister and thinking about those that we love and that we care about. And let's not be selfish with God tonight, but let's share him with the people around us. So, Lord, I just want to come to you tonight as we begin our service. God, I want to pray for the people that are in the path of the, the hurricane in Florida. God, I pray that... God, I pray that those that are still there that couldn't leave, I pray that you would just put a hedge around them, Lord. God, I pray for your protection on those people, Lord. I pray that you would help those that are in need out in the Carolinas, Lord. I pray for those in Georgia. God, I pray for all those that are on that side of the country tonight. God, I pray for the desires in this place tonight, Lord, for the healings that need to take place. God, I pray that you would hear us tonight, God, because we're crying out not for ourselves tonight, but for our neighbors. God, I pray for our loved ones tonight. God, I pray that you would that you would just touch this assembly tonight, Lord, that you would just help us to just bear the burdens of our brother. God, I pray that you would help us tonight, Lord, that you would hear our needs, that you would hear our callings for you tonight. God, we love you. We just desire your help in this place, Lord. We lift up our prayers to you tonight. In Jesus' name.
God that we serve. He is so mighty. He's so magnificent. He's so powerful. He's so great. He's so wonderful. He's everything that you can imagine good wrapped up in the one package. He is everything, Brother Josh, that we could ever ask for. And he has blessed us beyond measure. He has poured out of the windows of heaven on this congregation time after time after time after time. You look around this place, there is blessing after blessing, miracle after miracle. If he never does another thing, he has done enough and more. I look at my life and I think about all the blessings that he has poured out on my family and, and everything that he has given to us. And I, sometimes I just have to sit back and, and I just ask myself, have I been trustworthy enough to receive everything that he's given me? Is he able to trust me with the blessings that he has poured out? Is he able to trust me with the money that he gives me, with the, with the health that he gives me, with the people that he puts in my life, with the relationships that he creates in my life? Can he trust me with those things enough to be able to use them for the kingdom of God and not just use them for my own personal gain? Can he trust me with the things that he gives me to further the gospel? And tonight as we think about that, as we go into a time of giving, can he trust us to give back to the kingdom of God? And we, we have so many ways that we can do that. We've got GiveLify, and we've got PayPal, we've got text to give We have so many options, Brother Josh. Just pick one and be a blessing. But we have a prayer that we'd like to pray, a declaration of faith. And if you would pray it with me tonight, let's come together and pray over this offering. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaken together, and running over. And I am a tither, and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. And therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah, church. Let's just keep that going for a minute. Let's just give him a little praise. Let's just show him that we love him. Let's just love on God for a little bit tonight. just reach a hand up here and just help me pray over this good looking group of young people tonight God we just want to pray over Riverbend Kids and Riverbend Ignited tonight Lord we just ask that you would help us tonight to be to be a group that can learn Lord to be a group that can take the word and apply it to our lives God I pray that you will help us just to build on the foundation that you've laid for us God to, to build that faith in each and every one of these young people Lord I pray that you would protect them everywhere that they go Lord I pray that as they leave this place tonight when the service is over, God, that they're going to walk out of this place stronger than they came. God, I pray that they can be witnesses into this world, and I pray that they can win their friends. I pray that they can be a witness unto you, Lord. I pray that you would just be a blessing in their life tonight, Lord. God, we thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for your many blessings. And God, we just want to pray over every one of these young people tonight, Lord. Pray that we learn something tonight. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, Jack. And as they're going back, our pastor is going to come and bring a word. Let's just show him how much we appreciate him tonight as he comes to the pulpit. Thank you, Brother Richard. Well, what about that praise and worship time, huh? Ain't that wonderful? Woo! Man. I was hoping they would bust out into one more time, one more round of that. What a mighty God we serve. I like it. I like it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. It's good to see everybody. And uh, I know I didn't make enough copies tonight. Was it perfect? That's only because some, some of them didn't take Naren. Because there's more people here than I made copies tonight. Somebody, somebody said something the other day about uh, my daughter marrying Noah. And I said, hold on a minute. That's, y'all don't be talking about that yet. And... Uh, they said, uh huh, it's your little girl. I said, I ain't, I ain't talking about my little girl. I'm trying to decide if I want him to marry her now. <laughs> they probably should have got it done before I knew him better because now I'm wondering. <laughs> I said it in front of her, so I'm not talking about her behind her back. Um, this, this may be the last night of. Strategies of a Cretan revival. I feel like I've got a couple things in here that really could be a blessing to us. Um, <clears throat> we, we will just not really review, but it's necessary to review um, based upon the way these next three or four scriptures line up. But uh, um, God is good. What'd you say, Deb? That's what I thought. And all the time, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Um, got a phone call today from a, uh, uh, he's a friend. I can call him a friend. We don't hang out or anything, but he pastors in another community, actually another type of church, but uh, he said, I just want to get a little testimony from you. He said, I'm hearing great things going on in New Madrid. 
when he gave me three or four instances. And that's, that's great. I'm glad of it. <clears throat> we had 172 in house Sunday morning. And we're very, very grateful for that. But, but, you better mind your business. Because if people start talking about you, they're also going to start watching you. And you better be what you claim to be all the time. Ain't that right, Brother James? He was telling me several months ago, before he ever started coming to church here, Garrison and them were filling potholes out in front of his house. And he went out and said, can y'all come bring some of that up in my driveway? You know, trying to take care. And then Garrison came home and told me about it. And then lo and behold, Brother James shows up at church. So I hope Garrison didn't cuss him out or nothing. No, he won't do that. He, he better not. I still whoop his tail. He does that. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, that word for, F-O-R, it's not the biggest word in that verse, but it probably has the loudest message in that verse. For is a conjunction that connects the previous statements and exhortations with the following statements and exhortations. So for is speaking of everything we've taught for the last, excuse me, five weeks as it pertains to the things we're going to teach tonight. We've studied and shared that the ministry and purpose of Titus is to preach order into the churches at Crete. The purpose of those that hear is to obey and thereby reflect the characteristics of God's order in their church and their lives. There'll be preaching first. Paul is going to preach to Titus. And then Titus is going to preach to these churches. And the book says, you can't be saved without a preacher. You better have somebody preaching truth into your life. Then there will be order. When Titus begins to preach, there'll be order in all the areas that are lacking. And there will be elders or pastors appointed in every city. The common thread upon which they will preach and order will be brought, elders will be ordained, is the same word. He calls it the faithful word. He calls it sound doctrine. Well, at the same time, same message, hear this preachers and teachers, the same message preached at the same time will exhort believers and convince unbelievers. The reason for this is there are many folks in Crete preaching an empty doctrine void of submission to the word of God. An empty doctrine, vain doctrine, every preaching you hear don't help you. That wasn't good English but you got the gist of what I'm saying. There are times here when the preaching is more inspirational than transformational. And that has nothing to do with the preacher and everything to do with the receiver. Can I get an amen or something? Amen. And Paul's telling Titus, these people preaching this false doctrine have got to be shut down. Whether they are removed from preaching or you remove yourself from listening to them, you are not strong enough to continually subject yourself to preaching that is not true.
And these folks are preaching a message to these people that is only a message of condemnation and it has no hope. A message to which these people have seemingly resigned themselves to believing. Remember we told you Paul quoted that prophet that said all these people from Crete are liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. He had prophesied that 600 years ago before this and they were still living down to it. Titus, when he comes here, this is so important. This is so important. This will be the third time that I've brought it to you. Titus is to make sure that his heart stays pure. That is not God's job. It's our job to keep our heart pure. That's because when you have a pure heart, I feel the Holy Ghost just went. When you have a pure heart, I'll explain myself if necessary. You preach faith. You preach hope. And you preach love. And you preach possibilities. But if you are messed up and defiled in your mind and your heart, you preach doom, you preach gloom, you preach down, you preach glass half empty. Y'all got to stop preaching that nonsense. So you saying all of us are? Nope, but I ain't talking to you if you ain't. But if it's, listen, that hee-haw song was only as funny as long as hee-haw was on. We got people that sing that. That's your anthem. You know, gloom and despair and agony on me. Get rid of that stuff. And, and you can't, hear me now, you can't just decide to start speaking life and start speaking faith. You got to get your heart right first. Because the book says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The reason why that you speak negativity, that you speak doom and gloom, and you speak that the world's going to hell in a proverbial handbasket is because your mind and your heart are defiled. That's what the book says. So the first place, if you want to be changed, the first thing you got to do is, yeah, I recommend this, I do it quite often. How about Psalm 51, when David said, create in me a clean heart, which basically says, all of this old me has got to die. And renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. If you, need, if you have trouble repenting, just go read Psalm 51 and pray it straight from your lips to God's ears. Those that are defiled and unbelieving see everything through a defiled and unbelieving lens. I don't want to whoop a dead horse. But Jesus Christ is not out of style. He is not weak. He is not tired. He is not worn. He is as powerful today as he was when he said, let there be light and there was light. And the people that are filled with the spirit of God have to reflect who their God is. And your God's not sick, your God's not weak, your God's not on the run. He's on the throne, and he's still strong, and he's still large and in charge. You've got to believe it. He said, you claim to know God, but your actions prove that you really don't know him. Titus is to continue to speak the things of sound doctrine. If you ain't got Acts 2 down, stay out of Revelation. Am I, do I sound like I'm mean tonight, mad or something? I don't want to. But you better get the gospel. 
It better be, it better be woven in the fiber of who you are. You better know that the death, the burial, and the resurrection is the gospel. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking or the other, in other tongues is apostolic. And it is what the apostles and prophets did. And that's the only foundation upon which we can build any kind of anything. Because that's what's going to save you. If you don't know what Acts 2.38 says... You need to memorize it. And don't be satisfied with 2 and 38. You need to remember 2 and 39 also. And then it wouldn't hurt you to remember 2 and 40. And then while you're thinking about it, you ought to learn 2 and 1 through 4. That's when the church was born. That is when the New Testament church was born. Jesus said, I don't know why I'm saying all this, but somebody needs to hear it. Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter number 11, when the Jews started getting on Peter for preaching to the Gentiles, he said, what was I supposed to do? The Holy Ghost fell on them just like it did on us at the beginning. You just got a little free Bible study in the middle of a Bible study. But we learn, don't, please hear me, please hear me. Don't let life get you down where you can't preach the gospel. Titus is to continue to speak the things of sound doctrine and it is by the content of his message that he will distinguish himself from other believers, from other preachers, excuse me. Remember what that word meant? Y'all remember tower up? Anybody remember when I told you that? Stand out? It ain't because Titus was going to show up with a $1,000 suit on. It's because Titus was going to show up preaching the gospel. The same one that Paul preached to him the same one that Ananias preached to Paul, the same one that Peter and the disciples preached to Ananias. We're going to get there. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. Titus is to teach, everybody okay? Titus is to teach that the mature men who are believers should be sober. And and y'all figured out yet? Old women supposed to be sober. Old men supposed to be sober. Young women supposed to be sober. Young men supposed to be sober. It's right here. It's what the Bible says. So they, these mature men who are believers should be sober. They should be dignified. They should be self-controlled and healthy in the faith, in love, and in patience. Listen, I don't want to get off on a a tangent, but people always talk about all the lifestyle rules y'all have are like 90% to the women and 10% to the men. That's not true at all. Men and women ain't the same. And most of men's problems is between their ears and in their temper. Okay. It's true. It's true. It's how we're wired to be tough and stuff. I wish they would talk to me like that. Pow, smack them, punch them, hit them in the nose, hit them in the mouth. You know, why do you think the Bible said I would that men would pray everywhere Lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. That's exactly what this means right here. Men, we got to be leaders in having healthy faith, healthy love, and I think maybe more than anything, healthy patience. Don't lose your cool and act stupid. Because things ain't going like you think they ought to go fast enough. 
And don't give in to the pressure to be manly when you should be godly. And that wasn't even in my notes. That just came out of heaven. Man, we got to be leaders. You got to be healthy in the faith, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. The mature women who are believers. Yeah, I'm sorry I said old women and old men a while ago. Somebody got on to me for that the other day. And, and uh, The main problem is, is I feel like I need to say I'm one of them. <laughs> the mature women who are believers should behave in a manner exampling godly qualities that have been handed down, endured, and proven to be right. Enduring qualities that have stood the test of time. Qualities that have proven themselves to enhance the order that God wants Titus to bring to Crete. These ladies are not to be critical and judgmental of people, speaking things designed to assassinate the character of others. Slanderous, remember? Diabolos, which means the slanderer, which is the same name given to the devil as the accuser of the brethren. Ladies, you can't line up with the devil about when it comes to talking about people. I don't know if it's good or not, but it's true. They are, they too are to stay sober and teach wholesome things. Their students will be young women or men, less mature believers, whom they will also teach to be sober. They will teach them to love their husbands. Y'all remember we talked about that last week? Yeah. Butterflies don't teach you to love your husband. I've been getting these pop-up ads on my social media. The right kind of cologne ain't going to make you love your husband either. The amount of money in the bank account ain't going to make you love your husband. I don't care if he writes you a note seven days a week in the morning telling you how much he loves you and writes XOXOXO at the bottom. That ain't going to make you love him either. You're going to have to learn to love him. That's what the book says. You got to be taught to love your husbands the right way, and you got to be taught to love your children the right way. Yeah. And loving them the right way is not excusing everything they do and blaming it on somebody else. Man, I'm on a roll tonight. It's on like a pot of neck bones. Look here. I prayed about this. This is heavy on me. This is powerful. We're about to get somewhere too. This, I'm just telling you what happened before the four. Look here. They will example and thereby teach a lifestyle that reflects true moderation or balance as determined by God. This will be revealed in them being discreet or having self-control. They will be pure, focusing on doing what God has trusted them with rather than what others are not doing the way they're supposed to. They will be good. And the word says obedient to their husbands. And I taught you, I've taught you, I will teach you if you decide to get married and you go through premarital counseling, which you will do if you want me to do your wedding. Oh, I've been threatening to retire from the wedding business. 
Obedience doesn't mean, ladies, that you are his slave or his servant. The word means you trust him to lead you home. It's not a subservient. If you've heard me preach any at all, you know I don't believe that nonsense. That me, Tarzan, you, Jane, and I carry a club and you stay home barefoot and pregnant, that's stupid. That's not biblical. That's not biblical at all. I read it. I read it in the, the bread. You should have read it too. The Bible says I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church. That's a big deal. You know how much he loved the church? He gave his life for it. I make you think, woman, get me something to drink. You better not do that nonsense around me. I'll call you out in your own place, at your own house. Not only that, my kids will call you out. True story. If you show up at my house and treat my wife like she's your servant, you ain't coming to my house no more. Ain't that right, boys? You ask my boys about it. That's true. true statement. I ain't making it up. The young men are to also be exhorted to sobriety. Their lives, does anybody remember why we're supposed to be sober? It is not because drugs and alcohol are bad. It's because you can't think straight on drugs and alcohol. You don't know who to love on drugs and alcohol. You don't even know who to go home with when you're on drugs and alcohol. Matter of fact, you don't even know where home is. And if somebody, you're going to get this, tells you, man, I don't think there's nothing wrong. Jesus drank wine. You could take him to Titus. And then you go look in medical facts and find out what one beer does to you, what one glass of wine does to you. One glass of, one glass of wine will end you up in the hoose gal and everybody calling you Otis. It will. Right place, right time, right stuff. You got a little sickness in your body or something. Alcohol goes to your blood. Say, man, I can drink everybody under the table. That's the craziest thing. Why do you want to? Better be good. I'm on a roll, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Trust me, they don't want to have that argument with me anyhow. All right? Jesus was not getting liquored up. Okay, period. But Titus, have you ever seen a book that said so much about being sober? As this one? Anybody? I started to say old again. <laughs> Mature men, be sober. Mature women, be sober. Young men, be sober. Young women, be sober. Kids, too young anyhow. Not really. You still get it, but that, you heard me. The young men are also... Exhorted to sobriety, you're supposed to live your life as an example, a pattern of the work that God desires to do in somebody. Young men, we are supposed to be examples of what God wants to do in somebody's life and live accordingly. They are to be adamant regarding keeping the doctrine pure. They are to be dignified. Y'all know, fellas, that's with the, the mature men and the young men. Act like you got some sense. Okay. Without guile, ain't no room for shady in a child of God. Mm -mm. These men are to speak in a way that offers no opportunity to condemn their character. Why does it matter? if your character is condemned because you represent Jesus. And if you don't be who you're supposed to be, then they are validated in saying he's not who he's supposed to be. 
Then, I didn't teach you this, but it's in there. I'm just going to hit it real, I'm just going to hit it real high. If you work for somebody, your work should reflect the operation of the spirit within you, not whether you like your job, like your boss, or like the people you work with. Said, don't back talk your boss. It's in the Bible here. Don't steal from your boss. But show faith in God on the job. And that will be what you're known by. Don't be the troublemaking employee, the rabble rousing employee. Don't be the one that constantly telling everybody you don't make enough money. You're working hard and they're getting rich. Oh, I hit a clunker right then. I'd say I'm in the word. He said, I want to bring order. And order shows, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong in this place. Order shows up in every area of your life. Every area. It's supposed to. Wasn't no time Jesus wasn't Jesus. Matter of fact, he, he was just borderline disrespectful to his mother and daddy when he was 12 years old, Brother David, because in his mind, they shouldn't have expected anything else. You know who I was. You know who I am. Don't you think I should be about my father's business? I got a message brewing about that. All these things I just touched on. Is everybody with me? I feel like we're distracted a little bit tonight. Is everybody with me? Everything I just covered comes before four. Now, I covered a lot. Matter of fact, the truth is, the demands of grace are much higher than those of the law. There's a lot there. I, I have to confess, you read some of that stuff and you're like, man, ooh, I ain't sure I can pull that off. That's why it's before the four. Because then he says, for, it's a conjunction combining two thoughts. So he said, these are, oh, I feel Jesus. Man, I wish I could just, ugh. These are your expectations. And here's four. And then he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Why is that important? That all men? Number one, that includes me. And number two, that includes everybody I meet. So if I go talk to somebody about Jesus, that fits them. The first time grace is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It is later, but just as profoundly mentioned in Matthew's gospel, when the angel said unto Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. With the word favor being from the same word, Greek word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, which is translated grace everywhere else. It's the same word. So when the angel said it, he said, you found grace with God. See, this was indicative of how God moved upon people under the old covenant. He chose them, he blessed them, and they operated or functioned accordingly. But in the little short obscure book of Joel, or Joel, he prophesied that there was coming a day 
when the Spirit would be poured out on everybody. Joel 2, 28 and 29, when God would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, told them that what they witnessed in Acts 2, 1 through 4 was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and he reiterated it in Acts 2 and 39, letting them know that the fulfillment of this promise is available to everybody. Paul, in his exhortation to Titus, and in light of the clearly defined attributes I just listed to you that must be birthed, nurtured, and repeated, that's what discipleship is, Something's born in you, something's nurtured and brought to life in you, and then it's repeated. Remember? Come on, y'all got to remember, Paul said, whatsoever things you learn, seen, or heard in me, do them. Okay. Do y'all feel the spirit in here? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost like, man, I feel like the Lord has got like something special moving in here tonight. These attributes that must be birthed, nurtured, and repeated in the lives of everybody that Titus will minister to, and they in turn will minister to others, offers this. The grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now that's a reference that all New Testament believers hear and understand, right? They know that salvation can't be known, understood, or definitely received without the grace of God. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, for by grace or faith are you saved, and that through grace, or that through grace through faith, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast, it's the gift of God. They know, believers know, that this salvation that you've been blessed to experience came to you because of the grace of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You weren't born in the right family to have it. But God loved us so much that he came down and he gave us an opportunity to be saved. It's his idea. It's his plan. Without him, we had no hope. Ephesians also says you were strangers to the covenant of promise and without hope. It cannot be earned. It cannot be bought. It cannot be inherited. It only comes because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. See, Brother Shannon, we were going to perish without grace. We were damned had no hope without grace. It is because of God's grace, I'm going to slay some sacred calves tonight, so get ready. It is because of God's grace that we all have the opportunity to be saved. We are not automatically saved because of grace but we have been shown the way of salvation because of grace. The grace of God that bringeth, what's ETH mean? Keep on bringing. Salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, does that mean that everybody's saved or that everybody has the opportunity to be saved? Opportunity. I've taught you this before. I'll reiterate it again. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord told Noah how to build a boat, told him what to build it out of. He told him how big to build it. He told him how to design it. He told him to put a window at the top and a door in the side. But Noah wasn't saved till he went through the door. He could not hang out there and say, I'm the boat man. I am the man who built the boat. But he had to go in the door. See, grace was an opportunity. I know that, I know that doesn't line up with, with 
uh, modern popular religion, but it's true. Grace gives you the opportunity to be saved. Look at this. I want you to think with me. Not only does grace offer you the opportunity to be saved, grace continues to work in our lives, helping us to obey the leading of the Spirit into that abundant life for which Jesus came. Paul is declaring to Titus, I want you to stay with me now, the same grace whereby you were given the hope of salvation gives you the same hope to become and or be a mature believer who teaches immature believers how to find and function in the order that sin stole from us. Grace does not simply download salvation to you. Grace does not download maturity to you. But it offers hope that these words of exhortation can be realized in every one of us. Just as we have to believe and obey in order to be saved from sin, we have to believe and obey in order to live free from sin and in the power of the Holy Ghost. Grace, stay with me now. I know this is a lot, but I want you to get it. Grace enables, empowers, and opens the door so you can accomplish everything God desires for you. The same grace that gives you the opportunity to be saved gives you the opportunity to become perfect in the eyes of the Lord. Grace, I want you, y'all got to stay with me now. I, I don't want to lose you because I, I, I prayed and struggled over this. I, the truth is, Brother David, I don't want to get lost myself. So grace, as I'm describing it now, is a teacher. The same grace that offers the hope of salvation is a teacher. And it teaches us that first, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. I got to let you know this. It may be on your handout. I typed way too much tonight. And I know y'all were scared when you saw it. It was near about two whole pages. It's all right. <laughs> denying is not a supernatural word. It's a word that denotes a decision must be made. Denying is not God's job. I've heard several people say that we're living sinful in any number of ways. I prayed for the Lord to take that away from me. And he didn't do it, so it must be okay. I've heard it many times, not just once, many times. First thing grace teaches you, oh God help me. The first thing grace teaches you is deny ungodliness and worldly lust. I looked up deny. You know what it means? The definition to deny, refusing to be identified with. Ungodliness. I want to dig down here, but I don't have time. It is a refusal to honor God. Grace says, deny ungodliness, deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Those passions are desires that belong to the world, that come to me from the world. I don't have time to dig on it, but let me tell you, uh, the Lord's Prayer, two things he says, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Does anybody remember what I taught you that was? Lead me not into temptation is when my stupid self wants to go places, do places, see things that I don't need to, things that I'm attracted to. 
deliver me from evil is things that come to me. Temptation is things I want. Deliver me from evil is things that come after me. All right? Things that will happen in the daily life that come to me. I got to deny it. Those things that come to me. How much of what you want in life or how much of what I want was presented to me by the world? And then I have to find a way to dress it up and make it okay to be a child of God and participate. How much of what I value and hold dear and is important to me came to me from the world? Let's reiterate. We are to refuse to be identified with things that do not honor God and things that line up with the desires of the world. Now here, it's the grace of God that teaches us. Why do we feel that the lines between the holy and the profane, the godly and the worldly, why do we approach it as if it is God just wanting to make our life miserable? Why do we approach it as it's just things that God don't want us to enjoy? Why do we feel and behave as if the thou shalt not are God's judgment and damnation at work or he just wants us to look, feel, and act weird? But it's really the grace of God? Huh? Well, think about that. If this is indicative, he said first, listen, the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Everybody knows what that is. It's the grace that gives you the opportunity to be saved, repent of your sins, be baptized in his name, and filled with the Spirit. Hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now think about it. The grace of God came so that I might be saved from the penalty and judgment of sin. So what is grace trying to save me from right here? Well, think about it. All grace does, Brother Chris, all grace came for was to allow me to leave behind this and go to Jesus, be reconciled. So what's this grace trying to do that's a teacher? It's, think about it. what do you think this does? What do you think it does to the mind of God that we have allowed the gospel to be bastardized and perverted to the point that people view him as somebody out to get you when he gave us grace to be saved and he gave us grace to ensure our salvation. God is for you. He is not against you. And the grace of God that's trying to keep you away from the world is because it's safe because he wants to save you because he wants to help you stay pure mind and he wants to help you stay pure heart and he wants to let you have a full life and an abundant life and he wants you to walk in the fullness of what he has for you and so grace comes and teaches you what to do and what not to do not because he wants your life to be miserable but because he wants your life to be full Think about it. Think about it just a minute. We've been talking about, we're going to talk about it Sunday. Not, not Maybe not in this one, but in the next one. The Bible talks about identifying with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Whew. 
You know what God wants to do in you? You're going through what you're going through because grace is trying to save you. Brother Cody is teaching me how to be an overcomer. But I can't learn how to be an overcomer unless I overcome some things. But somewhere in our thinking, we got in our mind that it was all going to be in a shout at Sunday. Like, whoa! Think, think about it. How many people have got tore up from the floor up uh, on Sunday night and you woke up Monday morning and you was exactly the same as you was the other day? And you felt flawed and you felt like something was wrong with you and you felt like that maybe you just really didn't even have nothing in the first place. No! You see, we're still human. And we need grace to help us leave behind the trappings of a carnal man's life and step over into that Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Here's the deal is we want new trucks and we want new cars and we want cool shoes and cool purses and cool clothes and the latest and the greatest and you were only put here to bring somebody to Jesus Christ. All right. All right. Oh, come on now. You see, we're striving for the wrong things. We're striving for corruptible things. We're striving to be accepted by a world. Yeah. Think, think about this. That without us is going to hell. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. Huh? To deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So you can live. Everybody say live. Yes. Here we are again. Y'all ready for this? Give me verse 12. Did I, have, did I tell you to do 12? Probably not. But that's all right. They'll think you messed up, not me. But it was really me. No, it really was. Teaching us. I did not put it on there, and I apologize for that. She did exactly what she was supposed to do, and then she just saved my bacon. <laughs> Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live, look at that, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The only trouble is that ain't the same word sober that's mentioned in the four previous verses. It's a different word. It means moderate. Reflecting the radical balance birthed within by faith from the Lord. What do you think when it says Radically balanced. Huh? Let me tell you what I think of. Jesus Christ. He didn't ever get too high. And he never did get too low. The reason is, Brother David, is the euphoria of feeding 5,000 men besides the women and children with one supper. That ain't why he came. If it was why he came, he'd have been happy. He'd have been overjoyed. That wasn't why he came. He stayed focused on why he came. And that way, the bad stuff didn't knock him off too much. And the high stuff didn't bless him too much. Because that was not his goal. He didn't come to walk on the water. He didn't come to open the blinded eyes. He didn't, all of that is a part of his ministry, but he only did it, Brother David, to save people. 
that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. He saith to the sick of the palsy, take up your bed. How many times, one time in Jesus' ministry did he deliver somebody and told them to go tell everybody about it? One time, Legion of Gadara. The only time that Jesus said, delivered him from all them devils, and then he said, you go tell everybody what's happened to you. Everybody else, he said, keep that on the down low with you, would it? The reason was that radical balance. Okay. All right. Look here. I'm, I'm, I'm like down to the last half a page. Righteously. I think, I think if you'll be honest with yourself, this word righteously right here has the opportunity to change your world. Look what it means. Judicially approved by God. Does anybody know what judicially means? Here we go. It came before him. And he determined if it was right or wrong. And this righteous living is living a life predetermined to be righteous by God. So all these things that we want to do, that weigh us down, that tear us up, that you, I've been there. What in the world was I thinking? Why did I do that again? Here I am again. Got to start it all over again. The Lord already brought that before his judgment seat and said, don't need to be doing that. We knew better. He'd already declared what's righteous and what's unrighteous. Y'all don't want to hear this. In this present world. That means in this age we live in. Well, they didn't have this in the Bible days, and they didn't have that in the Bible days, and that ain't the culture we... That ain't the culture we got to be worried about. Say, well, they don't do that in Africa. You don't live in Africa. You are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Who is you're supposed to show forth the praises of him that's called us out of darkness to this marvelous light right now. There don't need to be a new Bible. The principles of that Bible work today. Soberly, righteously, and godly. The word godly means inwardly devout or pious. That's an old word. Anybody familiar with that word, pious or piety? It's an, old, it's an antiquated word. But it means you are marked by or you show reverence to God. Who will take on the mantle of being what's pleasing to God, representative of God, and effective for God today? Who wants to live a life that reflects God's creative order? You see, everything grace is trying to do is to bring us back to what we were made for in the first place. And the first, the first thing grace has to do 
is get you changed. Where you repent, which means I'm sorry. It doesn't mean just I'm sorry. It means I will be different. I will be changed. I will not live this way anymore. But I will turn around and I will follow Jesus in everything. Then we're buried with him in baptism because all that junk that I died out to had to be buried for the remitting or the washing away of my sins. And neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now hear me, I, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody, but that's why we don't baptize in the name of the Father because Father ain't a name. And we don't baptize in the name of the Son because Son ain't a name. And we don't baptize in the name of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost ain't a name. But the name heaven recognizes and the name hell recognizes and the name that my the name that my sins recognize. I can call on everything else. But when I speak the name of Jesus, my sins have to bow down. It's true. It's true. Looking for that blessed hope. This is what grace come for. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Y'all ready for this? Of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, which one of them is it going to be? They need to make up their mind, right? They got it right. The only face of God we're ever going to see is Jesus Christ. Look here. You read some commentaries, they'll say they got it wrong. Oh, they didn't get it wrong. That's what it says because that's what it means. And every eye shall see him. And every knee will bow before him. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It says they that pierced him are going to see him. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous or excited, enthusiastic of doing the right thing, good works. Last verse, we'll bring it home. Hold up. Here's what he says to Titus. And in case you were so inclined to wimp out, chicken out, get frustrated, get angry, Brother Shannon, we're right back where we started. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Why is this the concluding verse? Because it started with the word, it maintained with the word, and it's going to stay with the word. And the book says, let God be true. And every man a liar. The way I read this, all them thou shalt nots that we quibble over and we fuss over and we gripe and we bellyache over and we think they're just out of touch with things. I want to be pretty. Pretty to who? I'm serious. 
I, I know that we'd like to gauge things off attractive, but you wasn't put here to be pretty. You wasn't put here to be cool. You were put here to be holy. And you were put here to be holy so you would be positioned to make a difference in somebody else's life. Because, Brother David, grace is not in our life just so we somehow manage to squeak through the pearly gates on the resurrection day. We got grace to be called out of darkness, to be saved, to be regenerated, to be born again. And the same grace continues to work in your life. Not so you can make it, but so you can make a difference in the world that God puts you in. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And sometimes it shows up in us. Sometimes it shows up in us. Stand with me if you would. Tomorrow, um, when it was all said and done, you gave... Uh, $2,500 cash offering, actually $2,499. So whichever one of y'all kept on squeezing a hold of George, you should have turned him loose. That was the Lord working on you. <laughs> but when it's all said and done, we're going to give about, we're going to pay. Tomorrow, I am leaving to head over there. Um, somebody has uh, donated six pallets of antibacterial wipes that we're going to carry over there tomorrow in a U-Haul. I'm coming back Friday. Uh, so I'm going to just deliver the offering by hand instead of sending it. Um, and uh, uh, so we're going to end up giving about about thirty two to 3500 from the church because we're going to pay for the U-Haul and the gas. So thank you. Thank you for that, and, and don't be surprised if we don't come to you again, because there's another one down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, as long as God keeps blessing us, yeah. we have to assume he blesses us to be a blessing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. You have to assume that yeah. automatically. So uh, uh, Brother brother Dainsworth's... Uh, son-in-law uh, works at a place that makes those antibacterial wipes and they're making them right now and we're going to pick them up tomorrow afternoon and carry them over there so desire your prayers for traveling safety I'm sure the interstates are packed with people coming out of Florida and what have you but uh, um, thank you so much for giving I, I couldn't be more proud of this church and, and what you're learning what God is doing in your lives it's a blessing, it's an honor to be a part of the River Bend Pentecostals and uh, serve God. So that being said, what do we got? If you want to make a pumpkin, you better get it out there quick because they're already putting money in them jugs. <laughs> and uh, them, them are the neatest little things out there. And uh, uh, Sister Ashley made one of herself and put poor old Bob's name on it. I just can't <laughs> believe that. Huh? I just, I thought that just does not look like Bob Ross. That looks just <laughs> like, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But they, them are great. I like all the effort that's been put in them. And I saw one that they made for Sweet Aaron. And uh, um, um, God's good, folks. He's good. Uh, Josh, come here, buddy. I've been weighing this. I've been weighing this all night. Come on up here with me. Come on up here with me. Josh was with us last week because he's a Teen Challenge right now. And uh, he's not supposed to be here tonight. But uh, Josh's wife passed away Sunday. And, uh, she's been here with us before. She's been to recovery before, 
And uh, Josh is going to need us, folks. She passed away Saturday night. And Josh showed up here last Sunday morning. And Brother Richard mentioned this, but I was so excited because every man over there that knew him said, Hey, Josh, it's so good to see you. We hugged him and we loved him. And, and God was being good to him. And he's still good to him. But would you help me pray for Josh and his family? It's going to be hard. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Josh. I pray for Angie's kids and her family. And I pray for Sister Barbara. I pray, God, that you'll give them strength and let there be peace throughout this. And I pray that you'll keep blessing my buddy. I pray you'll keep blessing him. Let his mind stay healed and holy and I pray, God, that you'll just continue continue to bless him and let him know that the river bend stands behind him and, and we're praying with him and we're holding up his hands and we're here. Let him know that we're here. Let him know that we're here. Keep him safe and solid. Let him finish strong. Get back in here clapping his hands and worshiping you because we need him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. I love you, buddy. I love you. So tonight I looked over the congregation and I saw people halfway here. You know what I mean by that? And I wanted to come back. I wanted to grab you. And I wanted to say, don't just sit here. Seize this moment. Because none of us are promised tomorrow. The Lord may not come for a thousand more years for the rapture, but we already know he's coming. So uh, please be in prayer for Josh and the Tanner family and Angie's uh, children, siblings. And uh, do I have any more announcements? Anybody? That's a surprise. Let's pray. God, we love you. We worship you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for these people. Thank you for having you that we can turn to. I pray, God, you keep everybody safe that's here. I pray that the word will resonate with us. I pray that the word will torment us if necessary. Wake us up. Speak to us. Minister to us, God, as we continue to try to be more like you and less like us. Keep everybody safe going home. Leave us back here next time Sunday in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>